Hey, we're here with Godier. Hi, welcome to Canada. Hey, Bookie, how you going? I'm doing great. Congratulations. Everyone's enjoying making mirrors. And there we go. There's the record. Uh, let's see. You know what? We're going to get to the music and talk about a lot of things, but I've got the record here and I've got the covers we can all see. So let's start with that because I understand that, like the music is very personal, but the front cover, the artwork is a very personal story also. Yeah, it's a piece of my dad's. That, uh, that I salvaged from an old cardboard box. It was discarded amongst some old newspapers and letters and things. I was cleaning out some junk and uh, found this little piece of cardboard. And, um, and I lived with it for a while. And I wasn't completely sure it was right for the album cover. And then I did a little bit of photoshopping, like this, um, this square here was not originally complete like that. It was kind of a different, uh, emptier kind of square. And I kind of wasn't sure. At first, I was trying to convince myself that the asymmetrical nature of it was a good thing. And then, but I kind of photoshopped it and liked it better. Symmetrical. So. And now, did you make it to the uh, to scale of a CD, or were you thinking album too? Like when you were thinking it, because it would look very different if you're do doing it at a large album scale. Yeah. Well, I tend to try to do vinyl artwork first because right. you can scale everything down from there. You know. And I think you know what? Just just to, as a way to to segue into the music, we are sitting here talking about your your hit record, which everyone is digging, and we're talking about the physicality of the CD or the album, and as much as the convenience of downloading and the sensational uh, convenience of the internet and in your case with YouTube with the video, if there wasn't this physical thing to hold and then to help give context, I think music would lose, like, it would almost lose a dimension almost. It is, it is a dimension I still appreciate. I still love collecting vinyl. Yeah, you know, a really nice print job with a beautiful package on vinyl is still, I think, feels like a record, right. you know, a real record. So. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, now on, on to the music and uh, uh, you know you hear you'll talk to people sometime and they go where'd you make the record they go I made it in some old barn up north well in this case you made it in some old barn but but again the barn had a big connection so let's let's elaborate on that yeah that's a that's a barn my dad built um, so mum and dad live on this block of land southeast of Melbourne and uh, dad built a house over the last 10 years and then he also started building this big barn there's lots of different rooms in it a couple of different levels and I took over a couple of rooms upstairs uh, and just put a lot of my recording stuff in there and, you know, just started experimenting. Now, now it, it, being so close to fam family, did you, did, did you have to put up a do not disturb sign? Did they call it dinner or like, you know, <laughs> mom's, uh, mom's coming to clean up the barn? Like, no, nah, nothing like that. Mom doesn't really go into the barn very much. But um, and that was the nice thing, you know, is like if, I, if I was working at a reasonable hour right. of the day, not in the middle of the night, then, uh, yeah, I could kind of maybe drop out, say hi to my folks, and maybe drop in for dinner. So. Now, it, it, the way it, it's always the case, uh, uh, the whole world sort of be, is being introduced to your music now, but with, with every case, it's always uh, an overnight, it takes a lifetime to be an overnight success with, with all art and great music. And, and in your case, um, you're a music fan first, and your love of music, uh, uh, for those who, don't, who, don't, who may not know your whole history, you had the band, your ba the basics in Australia, and, and your records, and, and listening to all that stuff, uh, there's a real love of, 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 the, of, of the greats of music, so that's where it starts, and it's so interesting that with, with, the, with the technique that you did on this record, with the virtualizing, and we'll get into more on that now, but none of that couldn't have happened without your basic, first of all, knowledge, but love for the basic bass guitar, drum, rock and roll. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, um, that's one perspective. And on the other hand, um, I guess there's also just the nerd in me that likes, you know, the, the, there's amazing things that, you know, quite accessible technology now can allow you to do, manipulating sound and... Right. Yeah, you know. But I, I, I'm saying it all started, like, your, your instincts. It all started with your instincts of rock and roll. Well, I was a drummer first and foremost. Right. So, you know, when I was a teenager, yeah, I was, you know, played a lot of rock. I was, you know, <clears throat> covering Nirvana and Soundgarden, Screaming Trees and Alice in Chains with my high school band. And it's like, I don't know, it's because I was maybe into bands like Depeche Mode that I started to get more into the idea of programming and using synthesizers and, right. you know, making more produced stuff on record, I guess. It wasn't all about just bass drums and rock and roll. But it was funny, I mean, like for three years I quit playing drums so you might say I kind of I forgot about rock and roll for three years I started sampling stuff started making tracks in my bedroom at home and then I met Chris from the basics and we started working as a duo doing lots of covers and starting to write original like rhythm and blues tunes I was like coming back to the drum kit so I was like reconnecting and and I'd actually never listened that much to soul music before then, so it was like he kind of, you know, put me onto a lot of, you know, great soul artists. Well, well, that's interesting because, like, Drawing Blood, uh, there is some a lot of soul Motown influence on that record. Uh, there's that track. Yeah, yeah, that track. Yeah, same here. Yeah, okay. Uh, now, but I think the concept that you came up with for finding sounds and virtualizing, or you want to call it, it it's it's almost like a, a chef taking an ingredient and then and then figuring out a, out a way how to enhance the uh, the the, uh, the meal by taking that ingredient and adding a different ingredient to change the texture of it. Mm -hmm. And that's what you did, which, which I find fascinating, to get those sounds. And it's very much a Dr. Frankenstein in the studio, just searching until you heard something, I guess, that, that 
connected to you emotionally. Yeah. Well, you can do it on a very, I think you can do it on a very pragmatic functional level. Like you can sit there with banks of synthesizers and, and trawl through patches that other people, programmers have created and maybe just kind of, you know, and that's not, that's not inherently sort of bad or less interesting, but you know, it's, it's more functional maybe in terms of going, oh great, well this patch will, will you know, will fill this space in a track. But I really like the aspect, yeah, of like, like you said, of kind of finding a peculiar old instrument that has maybe a story about it or that becomes part of my story that feels more personal. That, has hopefully a more peculiar texture rather than, yeah, as something about, I just got over the idea of, because um, I spent, I think, a while obsessing about different synth synthesizers and right. you, then maybe you finally get that coveted piece of gear you've thought about for years and you probably start to make all the sounds that, you know, people have made with that instrument before. Right. Um, so, yeah, on some level, you know, I'm kind of more interested in, you know, finding obscure sort of things that... And what role does the guitar play play in all this I, like like I just sit down and go okay here, here's the melody and and I, I'm, I'm gonna hear the chords there's very not rock in that regard like the no, guitar, I, I, the guitar I, I, has hardly any place in the way it, I make music it, so. which was fascinating because because you, you, at the same time you, you could take any of the songs you go call up the chords and, yeah. and and play them acoustically well I'm sampling the guitar right you know? yeah yeah but I don't play so let's talk about uh, somebody I used to know uh, like, like any song whether it's true or not, whether it's based on, uh, on, on, on a personal, one singular emotion, it seems the story of every great song is an amalgamation of relationships, of ideas, of things that you're, the, the, the author is able to put in a way that is still personal to everybody, but general enough that everyone can relate. Hmm. Is that the deal with this one? I think so, yeah. I think that's, um, that's a fine balance to be able to strike. Um, I mean, I, I, I like stuff that... I like songs that sort of say things in such a peculiar personal way that a lot of people just will never relate to it because it's too idiosyncratic to that. But you know, sometimes if that really connects with you, then you feel really, really connected to that person's particular worldview. I think, you know, this song is more, yeah, trying to find that fine balance between saying something based upon a lot of things I definitely remember and felt very strongly, moments I remember clearly from specific relationships, but yeah, saying it still in quite a universal way. Now, how did Kimber become involved? Were you friends with her before? Were you thinking of her for the part or was, did that come after? I wouldn't say we were friends. We'd met like five years before. I think we've become better friends since, obviously. Like we've been hanging out, <laughs> yeah. had to play together a lot. That's great. And even then, so we, we still sometimes seem to be like ships in the night. Like she'll fly in somewhere, we'll sing together and then like we'll see each other very briefly and then she's back on a plane somewhere else because we're so busy just doing different things. But, you know, we met like five years ago. She'd just moved to Melbourne from New Zealand. She was 17. She was covering one of my tunes. She was doing solo sets at a little club in Melbourne. So I went to see one of her gigs and, um, and she was amazing. Yeah, she was doing all sorts of great looping stuff on her guitar with her voice. Um, and we kind of didn't really stay in touch so much over the subsequent years, but then we reconnected at Francois Titez's recording studio where he was uh, producing bits of her debut record, Vows. He was mixing stuff on Making Mirrors, and um, he actually suggested I should, I should give Kimber a call. So. When I first heard the voice, I thought it was Bic Runga, another New Zealand uh, oh. artist. I thought it was her. Yeah, because uh, yeah, it's the same sort of thing. Um, now, being where you are in, in Australia and the seasons being different, mind you, we don't have seasons here in North America anymore, but... Uh, uh, does the weather play a part? Did the weather play a part? I mean, like, there's sometimes a record can be a winter record or a summer record. Did that uh, and being isolated where you were, what was it? Was it excessively hot at the time, or and did that play a role in it? No. Well, I went through two whole years worth of right. seasons. So you got or no seasons. seasons. <laughs> yeah. So there were moments. I mean, there was definitely. Uh, I mean, there's a song on there that um, the song in your light is very much. I think um. I'm not sure I would have written it had I not been at times that point in the summer walking out to these beautifully glorious sunny days. It's just very, you know, it's a sort of, it's a, it's a nature song. It's just a pure love of um, how much just the bright sun can give you right. a complete sense of, you know, just warmth from the inside, you know, from the outside, just taking it in. So, yeah, but I mean, I remember specifically, I mean, the weather had a bearing on, you know, as you said before, I was recording in this barn. Um, not an ideal place to record. It was great in terms of being close to my family and local to where I was living. Um, and great for um great for making music any time of the day not having to pay high studio rates for you know spending right. a long time because you know, it took a while to make this record but um the bar was not so good weather wise through right. the seasons because yeah it wasn't soundproofed and it wasn't sort of weatherproof by any means so i i quite remember you know in the in the middle of the winter going for jogs between every vocal take just because <laughs> it was impossible to stand there and consider singing just shivering and uh, you know in the middle of the summer i'd have to sort of start work 7 a.m stop around 11 a.m in the morning because it would just get like 40 degrees celsius in the bar right right pick it back up after dinner and then go into late at night because it was just got too hot up there and unlike like arizona in australia there is it a dry heat or is it uh, you know dude Oh, uh, Melbourne's, they say Melbourne has four seasons in one day, right. so it varies, you know, it can be quite humid sometimes, it can be dry too. Um, another thing uh, that makes this a record, uh, that's why I think is as much as every artist, they all, do, you know, declaring, we're never doing albums again, we're only doing songs, 
there's a context to a record. And another thing is the first track, much like Sgt. Pepper, but Making Mirrors, that, op- that, opening, that opening salvo of music does set a tone for what is going to come. It acts like an introduction and a gateway. Again, why, why something comes together conceptually and it's called an album. And I think I, yeah. I like when people do that. Cool. Um, and the, the, yeah, the first, I, I find the record just, just explodes off the top. And uh, if, if you were to pick other songs and singles, like Easy Way Out and Eyes Wide Open would certainly be a tough. Then you get into the second side. And I think one of the most interesting songs on the record, and I don't know if, you could, if you're going to do it live and if you'd manipulate the vocal, but obviously the state of the art is that, that just you know, uh, had me looking at the stereo going, okay, what just, what just happened here? Oh, cool. I'm a big fan of that song. Yeah. And it's fun to play live, yeah. I use a Boss Voice Transformer to do the voice in, nice. that, in that song. Uh, now, with um, somebody that I used to know, the tremendous success of, of the YouTube hits and everything, and a nice, again, a, a great convenience of living in this day and time. And then the band Walk Off the Earth from just up the road in Burlington here takes, t- takes the YouTube and the song and does the concept. What did you think when you saw it? I thought it was great. Yeah. I'd, I'd got at, at various points. I've been a bit burnt out, like seeing another remix, another cover of the song. It's like right. you know, and a lot. You know, some are okay, some are quite average, and uh, so I was I was a bit bit over it. But you know, then someone sent me that. I think I saw it when it had. 157 views. I remember looking at it because somebody sent it to me quite early. And it's funny because people now are still going, oh, I don't know if you might have seen this. <laughs> like, well, you know, yeah, I have. So. Well, when I, when I first heard the song and first saw the title, my first instinct, was I was going to, well, I said, hey, when I get to meet him, I'm going to ask him, is if you're familiar with the Elliott Smith song, somebody I used to know. Yeah, I know. Because that's like, you know, a personal song. And they're not that just, they're, they, you, you know, you, someone could say, wow, is that, uh, if they only heard the one. But that, that's almost that song. Him doing it's like on a strumming on an acoustic guitar. Yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful song. It's a beautiful song. Great record. That's from Off XO, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Figure eight. Figure eight. Uh, figure eight. Yeah. Right. Now um, in North America, I know that there was uh, one of the initial w- ways that you got out there too was some celebrity endorsements. Now, having spent time in LA when you did the Kimmel last week, now did, have you met Ashton Kutcher yet? No, no, I haven't met Ashton. <laughs> okay. I haven't uh, met Katy Perry or Lily Allen. They're all, yeah. Okay. Saying different things about my tracks, which is cool. <laughs> That's another cap. Now, were you in Melbourne uh, last month when the, when the uh, Australian Open was on? Were you were you at home? Oh, I was around, yeah. yeah. But we, I don't know, I don't have a television. So. Okay, because <laughs> uh, that was again the two things that have put 2012 for as far as North America concerned. Two great things out of Melbourne have been the Australian Open and Godier. So uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank you for taking time with us today, and uh, you're going to make a lot of people happy tonight. We'll see you back. You're going to be back at the end of March. So thanks yeah. very much for spending time with us today. Thanks, Bookie. You got it. Cheers.